Hello everyone! So no musical introduction today, but look at the views! So we're on the back side of uh, Sulphur Mountain in Banff with my son, uh, so that's where I'm going to introduce this video. So what we're going to do today is study the Intermediate Value Theorem, which is a pretty straightforward statement about continuous functions, but we'll see that it leads to really neat and uh, exciting unexpected consequences. All right, so I gotta go. We have to run down the mountain, but enjoy the views. To introduce the intermediate value theorem, let me show you one of the greatest races of all time, which is Usain Bolt's 100 meter world record from 2009. So here it goes. Set. That was crazy. 100 meters and 9.58 seconds. Unbelievable. All right, but what does it have to do with the intermediate value theorem? Well, let's try to uh, write down mathematically what Usain Bolt just did. So we could, for example, write down his position function. So he started at position x equals to 0, at time equals to 0, so his position function is a function of time, x of t, and he ended the race at position x equals 100 meters, and time 9.58 seconds. And its position function would be a continuous function that links these two points. All right, what the intermediate value theorem then is saying is that if you pick any point, any distance between 0 and 100 meters, say 50 meters, for example, then a same bolt must have gone through that distance for a certain time between 0 and 9.58 seconds. But that's pretty obvious, right? If he ran from 0 to 100 meters, then yes, he must have run uh, through every single point between 0 and 100 meters at some time between 0 and 9.58 seconds. Well, this obvious statement is exactly what the intermediate value theorem is about, but we'll see that as obvious as it sounds, it has very, very unexpected consequences. All right, so let's now formalize this mathematically. So here's the formal statement of the intermediate value theorem. Let f be a function that is continuous over a closed interval a to b, and let capital N be any number between f of a and f of b. Then there must exist a number c between a and b such that f of c, the value of the function, is exactly equal to capital N. All right, so let's see what that means in uh, a sine bolt case. So if I draw uh, the position function of a sine bolt, so we started at zero, accelerated, probably reached some sort of peak maximal velocity, and reach 100 meter at 9 and 9.58 seconds. So that would be the position function of a sine bolt. Now what the statement of the theorem is saying is the following. If you pick any capital N, so f of 0 is 0, f of 9.58 is 100, if you pick any capital N in between, for example 60, then there must be a C, so there must be a time between 0 and 9.58 seconds, such that the value of the function was exactly equal to 60. And indeed there is, we see that it's going to be somewhere in here, maybe about 7 seconds. Right, so this is exactly the statement that I mentioned at the end of the video. This is saying that if you pick any distance between 0 and 100 meters, then there must be a time between 0 and 9.58 seconds at which the same bolt was running through exactly that distance. Which is of course uh, true. Alright, so there's another way of actually understanding the statement of the intermediate value theorem, which is in terms of the graph of the function. So if you pick your n here, so one thing you can do is draw a horizontal line y equals to n, and if there exists a c between a and b such that the value function takes the, va the, the, the value n, that means that this horizontal line must intersect the graph of the function. So another way of stating the intermediate value theorem is that all horizontal lines y equals to n for n between f of a and f of b must intersect the graph of the function. Now this is if the function is continuous at least once. So this is the exact same statement as the statement above. All right, so there's two things here that I want to emphasize in this statement. So the first one is the statement that there exists a number c. Now this does not imply that C is unique, that there's only one C. There may be more than one C. All that the statement is saying is that there exists at least one C. 
right? I can certainly come up with a continuous function, for example, something like that, where there will be more than one c for a certain n. So that would be the position function of a crazy runner that somehow goes forward, goes backward, and whatever, and so on. He would certainly not get the world record. But it's a perfectly continuous function. And if we pick an n, n between 0 and 100, for example, here, then we see that there's actually, in this case, three different points. So in other words, three different values of x, so three different c between a and b, such that the value of the function f of c is exactly equal to capital N, right? So there's more than one. So, but, but it still passes the horizontal line test in the sense that, you know, the horizontal line here does intersect the graph of the function at least once. It just intersects it more than, uh, more than once. So the, the point here is that the statement is that there exists a number c, but c may not be unique. There may be more than one c. All right, so that was the first thing I wanted to emphasize. The second thing is actually very important, is the continuity requirement. If a function is not continuous, then you cannot conclude that it satisfies the statement of the intermediate value theorem. <clears throat> so here's an example. If I take a function that has a jump, something like that, and I pick a n to be somewhere like here, then it is not true that there is a point c between 0 and 1 and 9.58 such that f of c is equal to n. And in fact, the horizontal line y equals to n does not intersect the graph of the function here. So for other values of n, it may be true. So for example, here it is true, but it does not have to be true in general. So we cannot conclude uh, the statement of the intermediate value theorem if the function is not continuous. So the statement of the intermediate value theorem seems pretty straightforward, and it is if you understand it in terms of the graph of a continuous function. But it turns out that the proof is not so obvious, so we're not going to go through it in this class. What we will do is focus on applications of the intermediate value theorem, and we'll see that there are really interesting and non-trivial applications. So this shows the power of mathematics. If you make a statement abstract or general enough, pretty often it may have consequences that are just totally unexpected. So our first application will be to find the roots of a function. So if you're given a quadratic polynomial, you know how to do that. You just use the quadratic formula, right? So minus b over 2a plus or minus and so on. But if you're given a more complicated function, or say a higher degree polynomial or degree higher than 4, then there is no such formula. So how do you find the roots of such a function? Well, it turns out that one way to do that is to use the intermediate value theorem. So let's see how that goes. Here's an example. Suppose that you want to find the roots of the function x cubed minus x minus 2, which is indeed continuous because it's a polynomial. So how can you do that? Well, the idea will be the following. You'll want to pick two values of x, x equals to a and x equals to b, such that the output of the function at one of them, f of a, say, will be negative, and the output of the other one, f of b, will be positive. Then we'll see that the intermediate value theorem implies that then that there is a root between a and b. So let's see how this goes. So if I pick as my first value, say, x equals to 1, then I can evaluate the function at this point. I'll get 1 cubed minus 1 minus 2, which is equal to minus 2, which is negative. And if I pick for a second value, x equals to 2, then f of 2 will be 2 cubed minus 2 minus 2, which is equal to 4, which is positive. All right, so now what is the intermediate value theorem saying? So it is saying that if you pick, so for any capital N between minus 2 and 4, there must be a C between 1 and 2 such that F of C is equal to capital N. So in particular, because the value of the function is negative on one side and positive on the other side, I can choose capital N to be equal to 0, right? And then the intermediate value theorem is saying that there must be a c between 1 and 2 such that f of c is 0. So in other words, there must be a root of the function between 1 and 2. Isn't it great? So we've now found that there must be a root of the function between 1 and 2 using the intermediate value theorem. So that's how you can use it to locate roots of a function. But that's not very precise, right? Between 1 and 2, that's a pretty big interval. But what you could do now is just keep going, right? You could reapply the intermediate value theorem again. So what you would do now is pick the midpoint. So 
of the interval that you started with. So in this case, that would be 3 half. And then you evaluate the value of the function here to see whether it is positive or negative. So in other words, to see whether the root will be on the right side of this midpoint or on the left side of the midpoint. So in this case, well, if you evaluate the value of the function at 3 half, you're going to get minus 1 over 8, I think, which is negative. So by the same argument as before, the intermediate value theorem then implies that there is a root. So because f of 2 is, is positive and f of 1 is negative, we know that the root will be between 3 half and 2. So there is a root of f of x between 3 half and 2, which is, you know, getting more and more precise. So we start with 1 and 2, then we get 3 half and 2. And you can keep going and, you know, do that as many times as you'd like, and you get a better and better numerical approximation of the root, because your interval is going to get smaller and smaller. So this method, by the way, is sometimes called a bisection method. So it is one numerical method for finding roots of complicated functions. It is not the most efficient way, but it works in, in full generality if you have a continuous function. So it's a very neat uh, application of the intermediate value theorem. All right, so let me end this video with a cool question. So here's the Earth, and suppose that you're interested in the temperature distribution over the Earth. So that would be a function which, uh, for a given point on the Earth, would give you the temperature at that point in a particular moment of time. Now let's just focus on the equator. So let's just look at the temperature distributions of all the points on the equator. Is it true that for any given time of the day, and for any day, today, tomorrow, 100 years, whatever, any given time of the day, there are two antipodal points, so that means points that are diametrically opposite, exactly opposite on both sides of the equator, that are such that they have the exact same temperature. So is it true that there are two such points for any given time of the day? Right, so right now, there must be two points, maybe somewhere here and on the other side, that have the exact same temperature. That sounds totally crazy, right? We'll see.